Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains in the deep, dark abyss. <laughs> and today, we are going to discuss submarines. Yes, submarines. As you know, recently I've been branching out when it comes to these lists, talking about other terrible ideas involving a plethora of different vehicles, and I figured now's a good time to talk about five of the worst submarines ever. The Farfa D class submarine. It's French, which is why that T is apparently silent. And now I looked at the pronunciation for it this time. So I'm going off of what I was told. So if someone's like, it's Farfa dead, I'm going to be really upset. But far as I understand, it's Farfa D. These were a group of four submarines that were very early when it comes to submarine technology, built for the French Navy at the beginning of the 20th century, between 1901 and 1903. They weren't exactly terrible, they could move around and dive. Of course, the namesake for the class, the Farfa D, did actually sink on a dive, so that was probably really bad. It was recovered and put back into service as the Foulet. Also, the Luton was also lost in a diving accident. So that's good too. Really, they just weren't working very well, and even if they didn't seriously enjoy diving and then not coming back up again, their range was atrocious. They were powered by electric motors only. And this meant they were only really good for port defense. Which, I mean, great, but other submarines can go out actually into the ocean and still do port defense. Like, they can do both those things, not just the one thing. In the end, the Farfa days were seen as kind of just a waste of time. They just weren't doing anything particularly well, and it was arguable that they might have been a bit dangerous. And all four were stricken and scrapped before World War I even started, by 1911. The Pravda-class submarine, or sometimes just the P-class, was built for the Soviet Navy in the mid-1930s. These were considered very large submarines for their time. On the surface, they displaced 1,200 tons, submerged 1,870 tons, and they had a length of 90 meters, or 295.3 feet. Big and impressive on the surface they may have been, but the reality was they weren't actually very useful. It was found that they were underpowered, and they took an obnoxiously long time to actually dive, and had very poor sea keeping. Even though they had double hulls, they were actually found to have a weakness in their hulls, and this had to be remedied by stiffening and weight cutting. A lot of sources seem to agree that these were probably the worst submarines of this era as far as the Soviet Navy was concerned but they did find a use for them. They were originally going to build four, they only actually finished three, they just canceled the fourth one because it wasn't worth it, and they were utilized for training purposes, training new crews to work on other, better submarines. When World War II broke out, they needed everything they had, but the P-Class would have been no good in combat, so they were utilized for transport duties. One was actually sunk during this time, but the other two did manage to survive, though they were later scrapped. The British K-Class. Oh boy. Yeah, now things are getting good. Okay. I gave you two vanilla choices. The last two, yeah, they were built. Yeah, they didn't work out. But you know, neither of them were called the Calamity Class by the people that worked on them. The K-Class was an early British submarine designed in 1913, and they were in commission from 1917 all the way till 1931. But during that time, especially during World War I, they were viewed as not good at all. For one thing, they were steam-powered. They used steam turbines for their propulsion. Now, the reason for this is that they were designed to keep up with the regular fleet. It was still early for submarines, and it wasn't really quite realized that submarines are generally better if they're not with the regular fleet ships. They're stealth weapons, and eventually navies would realize that they were much more effective operating alone or in a wolf pack with other submarines. But the Ks were designed based on the notion that they would be with the regular fleet. The diesel technology of that time would only enable them to go about 19 knots on the surface. 
but steam turbines would make them a lot faster, and that's great and all, but steam doesn't work well with submarines. The technologies clash very badly. For example, one of the consistent issues with the Ks was that water had a tendency to go down their smokestacks and put their boiler fires out, which you may recognize as being very bad. Their sea keeping and diving speed were both terrible, and their test depth, namely their maximum depth that they can dive to without being crushed, was atrocious. The maximum test depth they could work with would have been 200 feet, or 61 meters. This was less than their overall length. They were long ships at 339 feet. This meant that at a certain angle, it was possible for the bow of the ship to be at the maximum depth while the stern was still on the surface. It made diving incredibly complicated and way more difficult than it should have been. This reduced their usefulness overall. Oh yeah, and if something did happen to the outer hull, the eight internal bulkheads were designed and tested to withstand a pressure of about 70 feet, not the hull's rated depth of 200 feet. So if something went wrong with the hull, the internal bulkheads probably wouldn't have been able to do anything about it, which I'm sure filled the sailors on board with a tremendous amount of confidence for the Ks, which again, I repeat, they nicknamed the Calamity Class. During their lives, six of them wound up sinking, and not a single one was due to enemy action. It was all accidents, and only one ever even engaged an enemy vessel. K-7. She fired a torpedo at a German U-boat, but the torpedo failed to explode because the Ks just couldn't catch a break at any time, and K-7 had to retreat to avoid retaliation. As far as British submarine design is concerned, the Ks are probably the worst it ever got, but that does depend who you ask. The CSS H.L. Hunley. Okay, first question, what in the heck is CSS? I will answer this question. This submarine was under use by the Confederate States of America. Oh yes, it's time for the American Civil War. The H.L. Hunley was named after her inventor, Horace Lawson Hunley. He actually developed several submarines for the Confederacy. And mind you, these submarines were early, very early. And in that regard, you might be able to forgive the Hunley for her shortcomings since the technology was still very, very much in its infancy. She didn't even have a true engine of any kind. The propulsion used a propeller, but it was a hand crank. The crew on board would actually move the Hunley forward by hand. But it's also kind of hard for me to ignore the Hunley's shortcomings either, because she sank three times. Designed for a crew of eight men, seven of which turned the hand crank, which resulted in about 3.5 horsepower, while the 8th steered and directed the boat. The ballast tanks were at each end. They could be flooded by valves or pumped dry by hand pumps. Yes, hand pumps too. This whole thing is very old school and quite alarming, if we're being honest. Although she actually didn't sink because of this, at least not the first time. The first time she was on the surface and she was accidentally swamped by the wake of a passing ship. Hunley sat very low in the water and her hatches had been open at the time. There were actually nine people on board that day, and only four managed to escape, with the other five drowning. Another test was conducted on October 15, 1863, this time with Hunley himself on board. Rumor has it that he took command of the ship that day, even though he wasn't actually part of the crew. Also, it sank. They never really figured out why it did that, it just did. They raised her again, and she was finally used for her last mission, officially in service on the 17th of February, 1864, and out of service that same day. The reason for this has been a hotly debated issue for many years. She was actually operating on the surface at the time, though it was night, and given how low the Hunley sat in the water, even not submerged, she was still kind of stealthy. Now, Hunley's armament initially was meant to be kind of a dragging mine situation. She would pull a floating explosive charge with a contact fuse behind her, go under the enemy ship, and then the fuse would detonate as she passed by. But early on, this was kind of discarded, as it was considered dangerous due to the tow line fouling Hunley's screw, or possibly drifting into the submarine herself. Instead, they chose to use a spar torpedo, which was a copper cylinder containing about 135 pounds of black powder. This was attached to a 22-foot-long wooden spar. The Hunley would effectively full-tilt spear an enemy ship, back up, and set off the charge. 
and the Hunley did this. She totally sank the Housatonic. But the spar she was using that day wasn't meant to stick in a ship. It actually blew up on contact, and this meant the Hunley was way too close to the explosion. This must have done significant damage to her, as she never returned from her mission after sinking the Housatonic. She sank, and this time, the Confederates had had enough. They did not raise her again. They'd lost her three times. But later on, much later, in the year 2000, she was actually discovered and retrieved. She's currently sitting in preservation at the H.L. Hunley Museum. The Soviet submarine K-19. Oh boy. Soviet Russia and nuclear submarines. Now, nuclear submarines have been around for a while now. And using nuclear power on a submarine makes a lot of sense. It allows them to stay underwater for way longer. Weeks, sometimes even months if they have to. Much better than the old school batteries they used before. During the Cold War, both the United States and the Soviet Union were pushing to develop nuclear submarines. And the K-19 was the first of Project 658. The class's NATO designation would be the Hotel class. But the K-19 is kind of unique, even among the hotels. The later hotels were modified based off of the missteps with the K-19, but the 19 herself was hastily built by the Soviets in response to the United States' development in nuclear submarines. She had already managed to kill people before she was even launched. Ten civilian workers and a sailor died due to accidents and fires during her construction. When she was commissioned, she suffered multiple breakdowns and several accidents, a few of which threatened to sink her. Though impressively, she never actually did sink. The crew was able to save her multiple times. One of the more minor issues was the hull's rubber coating. It had detached during a full power run, and the submarine had to be completely recoded. During a test dive to her maximum depth of 300 meters, flooding was reported in the reactor compartment. Captain Zetiev, who was in command, ordered an emergency surface, but this caused the boat to heel over on her port side due to the water she had taken on. The issue? The construction workers that had built her had failed to replace a gasket. Yes, really. In October of 1960, the galley crew almost sank her because they disposed of wood from equipment crates through the galley's waste system. This clogged it, which caused flooding in the ninth compartment, and it filled one-third full of water. A lot of this might sound like slapstick minor nonsense so far, but it really could have sank the ship many times. But the biggest accident involved the reactor. Yes, there was a nuclear accident on K-19, on the 4th of July, 1961. She was still under the command of Captain First Rank Nikolai Vladimirovich Zatayev, and she was conducting exercises in the North Atlantic off the southeast coast of Greenland. The local time was 4.15, and the pressure in the sub-starboard nuclear reactor's cooling system dropped to zero. This was very bad, and the crew discovered a major leak in the cooling system, and this caused the pumps to fail. The boat couldn't contact Moscow and request assistance because another accident had damaged the long-range radio system. The control rods for the reactor were automatically inserted by the emergency scram system, but the reactor's temperature still rose uncontrollably. Decay heat from fission products produced during normal operation eventually heated the reactor to 800 degrees Celsius, or 1,470 degrees Fahrenheit. Zatiev did not have many options, and he made a pretty drastic decision. He ordered the engineering section to fabricate a new coolant system by cutting off an air vent valve and welding a water supply pipe to it. This very jury-rigged system actually wound up working, but it had required the men to work in high radiation for extended periods of time. The accident had released radioactive steam that contained fission products, which were drawn into the ship's ventilation system and actually spread to other compartments. The entire crew was irradiated, but the engineering department definitely got the worst of it. Seven of them, as well as their divisional officer, died of radiation poisoning within the following month. Within the next two years, 15 more members of the crew would die. Even with the jury rig system in place, they weren't out of the woods. They had to get to safe port. And instead of continuing their mission's planned route, Zatayev decided to head south to meet diesel-powered submarines that were expected to be in that area. He actually worried about his own crew mutinying given the situation, so he had small arms thrown overboard, except for five pistols that he distributed to his most trusted officers. 
Eventually, a diesel submarine S-270 did pick up the K-19's low-power distress transmissions and joined up with her. American warships nearby actually heard the transmissions and did offer assistance, but Zetayev was afraid of giving away Soviet military secrets, this awesome nuclear technology that was trying to kill them. So he refused and sailed to meet S-270 instead. When they met up, he evacuated his crew and had the K-19 towed back to the home base. The repair work on K-19 took the following two years, as they had to conduct it very carefully given the nature of the radiation. During the process, the surrounding environment was contaminated in a zone of about 700 meters. When she returned to the fleet, she was given the nickname Hiroshima. Yes? Really? The Soviets' official explanation for what happened was that it was the result of a faulty welding incident during initial construction. Because, of course it was. But some dispute this conclusion, suggesting that perhaps the crew had not attached a presser gauge to the primary cooling circuit, and before anyone realized there was a problem, the cooling pipes were subjected to a pressure of 400 atmospheres, which was double the acceptable limit. Either way, people died. And I've only given you the abridged version. There were so many accidents associated with this stupid submarine, and it was all because it was a rush job. Like I said, the following hotel classes, designated Hotel 2s and Hotel 3s by NATO, actually fixed a lot of the issues with the initial K-19. But K-19's kind of in a category all her own, being incredibly dangerous, successfully murdering more of her own crew than any enemy combatants. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Some Dude 267, Orange Glass, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Husband 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsun 131-232, Mr. Black Rose Tribal Typhoon, Master of None, Josh Johnson, and Lock Kraken. Until next time, this is Darkness, individual of Fond, farewell.